Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and today we are talking about racism, or more accurately, the non-racism of the biblical faith. Where would you like to start, Greg? There's a couple places we could start. Let me start with a personal story. When I was much younger, not married, and could stay up to ridiculous hours and often did, on cable TV there was this older gentleman who would sit behind a desk with flags behind him and, and teach the Word of God. And a lot of it seemed good, but something seemed off. And not having the internet back in those days when there were dinosaurs, <laughs> I could not simply go look him up. And so I, I would stop as I did channel surfing. I'd stop now and then and listen and say, mm, a lot of this is good, but something's just not right here. And one of the, the key things in these kind of situations is he never identified what theological connections he had. He didn't um, associate with a denomination, a specific church, a creed, a confession, anything like that, which is, you know, red flag on the field for sure. It was months before finally I ran into a broadcast where he sort of laid all his cards on the table. The man's name was Arnold Murray, and he was a racist, and he used the Bible as his springboard for racism. He got at it in two different ways, both extremely creative and extremely ridiculous. One, he looked at the creation accounts in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and said, obviously, these are two very different stories. In the one case, we have God creating man in his image. But in the second, we have God specifically creating a, a different man, Adam and his wife, Eve. So we have the Adam and Eve line, but there are also other human beings out there as well who are not associated with Adam and Eve because Adam and Eve don't show up until chapter two and mankind's already busy in chapter one. So obviously there's, there's already two different sorts of origins. Now, if that's not bad enough, he went on to talk about the temptation story and by some, again, very imaginative and very ridiculous use of, of Hebrew verbs. He tried to argue that the uh, relationship between the serpent and the woman was a sexual one, that Eve basically got pregnant from the serpent. And so the child she bore, Cain, was half human and half demonic. This is yeah. extremely creative. And <laughs> this is ex I don't know. In case that's not clear, when I use that in connection with theological <laughs> thinking, it's not a good thing. It's not like, a good thing. We're not, not supposed to be creative when it comes to yeah, the Bible. Uh, and so this, this allowed him to argue for a, a, an Adamic race, which is apparently the, the pinnacle, and then other races, which are not bad, but they're not that particular race. And then there is a race that is actually half demonic. Uh, and apparently, by his reckoning, I'm not sure how he got around the Genesis flood, that race continued up into Jesus' time and into our own, so that when Jesus spoke of the uh, Pharisees as um, the seed of the serpent, he wasn't speaking spiritually or morally. He was speaking genetically. There were actually demonic genes in the Pharisees' DNA, or however that goes, DNA in their genes. I didn't listen to a whole lot more, nor have I ever felt any need to go back until like an hour ago and refresh my memory on this. If I have not reported it accurately, my apologies, but I think I'm pretty close to what he actually said. I'm certainly not trying to misrepresent him. I don't think I would have to. I think if you go back and, and do the research, you will find that not only does he say pretty much, if not exactly what I've said, he says things that are worse. Hmm. And, his, and if um, God answers, which is a fairly reliable evangelical website that tries to teach the Bible and does, does a good job of it. If it's to be believed, um, Arnold Murray's basic defense was to criticize anybody who criticized him to do ad hominem attacks and suggest that very probably the reason they were opposed to him is that they too were seeds of the serpent and of this demonic race. This is an extreme example of racism clo cloaking itself in Christianity. 
and and we can look at it. probably we probably should take a look at this just for a second and, and point out what's wrong with it but the truth is that there have been lots of christians down through the ages who have adopted one kind of racism or another and have tried to paint it with the colors of scripture having said that we can turn and look at the rest of the world and say they have too and they've done it a whole lot more but that doesn't uh, excuse us from um, pointing out where our brothers and sisters in Christ have done some very wicked things at times in the name of in the name of Jesus. Uh, looking at at, at um, Arnold Murray's weirdness just for a second. First of all, the two accounts are the same event. God makes man in His image. You're talking about Genesis I'm 1 and Genesis, Genesis 2. Genesis 1 yeah. and 2. And Genesis 2 then is simply a flashback showing day 6 in more detail. And any careful study of the rest of Scripture is going to make that really plain. It's not hard. Jesus said, he who made them in the beginning made them male and female. They were at the beginning, they're male and female. And he's speaking generically of, of humanity. And as you as you read through the rest of Scripture, we, we keep getting this. We have... We have Paul on Mars Hill. Let me read from Acts 17. Paul says of this, says of God, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing he's Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell upon the face of the earth. And has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord, and so on. Of one blood, all nations. Mm -hmm. There's there's no room for God creating various kinds of races, various I don't I I'm not enough of a biology student even to know the proper words here. Maybe you can help me out. Is it are we dealing with genus or kingdom or what? Humanity is humanity. Human beings are human beings. Man's made in the image of God. And although there's great diversity in that, there, there's no place where we can draw a line and say, this diversity means inferiority. You are a lesser folk than you people over here because of your skin color, your eye shape, shape of your nose, your height, your, you know, we go, we run through all the things whereby people have tried to draw lines and say, you are an inferior people and therefore ultimately a disposable people. The Bible will allow none of that. The diversity of the image of God is not inferiority. It is simply spectacular beauty, something we've talked about mm -hmm. before and we'll no doubt come back to again. There's also that, uh, I'm looking for it in Romans 5, where he says, by one man came death, mm. which seems to forestall any idea of multiple races. Like, we all as humans die. Like, this is self-evident. The Every, that's the one thing everybody knows is that everybody dies. The there, there's a there's a problem there too because essentially if you're positing that there are multiple fountainheads of of the human race and or races if you want to go that direction, then the gospel doesn't work hmm. because the 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 whole purpose of the incarnation itself was that. Christ would come as the second Adam. Uh, or I should say, it doesn't work consistently with the rest of, <laughs> of Scripture. It'll work in their own schema where they where they want to denigrate other races as something subhuman. But for any serious review of the Old and New Testaments, this kind of thinking makes salvation impossible for anyone who has a genetic difference. Mm -hmm. according to um you know demonic ancestry or, or anything like that yeah, yeah the yeah. the flood is one obstacle and then there's also jacob have i loved esau have i hated where you literally have twin brothers <laughs> that mm. god is choosing <laughs> one and not the other when there's no genetic disposition one way or the other like it's yeah it's clearly just the will of god in the wake of the flood we get this document in Genesis 10 called the Table of Nations, and it ends with these words. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. It's very universal, and we can look at that if we cared 
and we can see that even at that very early date, about 4,000 years ago, Shem, who's the recorder, the writer here, recognizes Babylonia, he recognizes Assyria, Syria, Egypt, the Greek islands, uh, the city of Zidon, all kinds of things where hum as humanity first burst out from its cocoon at the Tower of Babel and began to spread, he, he denotes or, or lists 70 different nations. But this was early on, and those people kept moving, as is the way of people. <laughs> and th there's like no- Like a rolling they, stone. Like a rolling stone, they gather no moss. <laughs> Uh, they keep moving to the ends of the earth. And this was during Earth's Ice Age when uh, the sea levels were lower, there were more land bridges, and no one in his family had built a ship. People could build boats and did. <laughs> yeah. Traveling the world was not a great difficulty. Mapping the world was not a great difficulty. Uh, and, and this is what the Bible presents. And that's that's chapter 10. Chapter 11, again, does a backspace and, and shows us why and how that happened. It talks about the Tower of Babel and traces the genealogy of the covenant line, 10 generations to Abram. And right off the bat, we are told, or God tells Abram, I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great. Thou shalt be a blessing and I will bless thee, the, uh, bless, bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And this is something that, this, this promise of Messiah, the blessing of all the families, all the nations, indeed of the whole world, is something that's carried on throughout Scripture, throughout the Psalms and the prophets, through Jesus, who speaks of God loving the world, God giving his son to save the world. We get to Paul, who looks back and says, the promise to Abraham that he should be heir of the world. This is not, you, you can't cut and end say, well, what it's it's just talking about this part of the world or this part of the lands or this section of geography or this section of the beings you seem to think are human. The language of scripture is, is universal throughout. Jesus came for all sorts of people, nations, peoples, kindreds, tongues. We we get it in the in Daniel and Isaiah, we get it in the book of Revelation. There, there, there's no red flags of saying, oh, but watch out for there, those those things you think are people. They're not really people. They're something else. They're out to deceive you. Or even, yeah, well, you know, God has plans for them, but not this one. God will deal with them someplace else. There's nothing of that in Scripture. And, and one of the easiest cures for racism is for God's people to start reading the Bible. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the sad things about black slavery in um, the United States before the Civil War was that blacks and whites in the South, particularly, were segregated into different churches. Mm -hmm. If they had sat by, side by side, hearing the same preaching from the same scripture, from Genesis through Revelation, without being doctored or tinkered or colored, eh, um, they would have come to the conclusion that, hey, we're brothers in Christ. There, there, there's no division along this, this newfangled term of race or skin color or place of descent or place of continental origin or whatever. Uh, and, and we probably should come back to this uh, at some point. But when Paul writes Philemon, he doesn't say, don't you all know that, that slavery is an abomination before God and it's abolished forever now that Christ has come as the servant of servants? He simply says, um, he's your brother, start treating him like it, and uh, you'll do that because you're a godly man, and you'll do even more than that, and make sure that this letter gets read in the church. <laughs> the Bible's approach is not revolutionary. It doesn't aim it. And this is for this Christianity gets flack. Well, if this, if you're so opposed to racism and, and racial slavery and other things such as this, why wasn't there an immediate call for tearing it all down? Very simple reason. Same reason that the, the, the Bible or the apostles did not demand an immediate end to polygamy. What are you going to do with people who have no education? There's a, a market system that does not support them in any fashion. They have no marketable skills. What's going to happen to them? Rather, the apostles let the slow work of the gospel transform the culture so that more and more slavery of whatever sort would become a non-issue, but it would not be such a rapid shakeup that individuals 
would be horribly hurt in the process. Now, the it's the also hardware, if I can interject, yeah. it's important not to conflate slavery with American chattel oh, slavery no. of black people. These are different institutions. We call them by the same name so often today. Yeah. But American chattel slavery is quite a different sociological phenomenon. And it's different, again, from what Israel practiced. Right. And so, yeah, it's, it's easy to use the one word and, and lump in all sorts of things. Now, the, rom the true romantic, the child of Rousseau and the French Revolution, will look at that and say, but no injustice may be tolerated even for a moment. So you, if you are not part of the immediate solution, you are immediately part of the problem. And you are just as bad as the slaveholders, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, that's not the Bible's way of looking at things. The Bible believes and teaches that stability, political and cultural and social stability, is a good thing. And the change can happen slowly. And that it, in general, is best for it to happen slowly. Not in the sense of slowly forever, but that not everything has to be fixed today. Now, everybody knows that evangelical Orthodox Christians are opposed to abortion. Nobody expects us to go out and start shooting abortionists. At least no one should, nor do we plan on it. That would be horrible mm -hmm. because that's not the way the gospel works. That's not the way Christianity works. And people who have done that are clearly misapplying the term Christian to themselves. I mean, yeah. there is, some of them do it in the name of Christianity, but we would denounce and, that and say, you're and, wrong about yeah, that. And generally, the church, their churches or whatever churches they were associated with do denounce them and say, yeah. they're not part mm -hmm. of this. This is not us. Yeah. yeah. And so we, we get kudos for that. But the flip side is there are other social problems that we can't fix immediately. We don't have the social leverage right now. Uh, and when we did, we didn't always use it properly. And we can, we can distance ourselves and say, you know, Christians in this age or that age had opportunities to make changes, they weren't mature enough. They weren't ready enough. That's unfortunate. Shame on them. They may, they're going to have to answer to God for some of those things. But in approving their faith, we're not approving their mistakes any more than future generations will look back. That, and in accepting some of our orthodoxy, they will not necessarily accept all the things that we screwed up with either. Mm. Christianity is leaves room for sanctification, both for the individual and for the church and for the kingdom as the centuries unfold. It's not excusing our sin, but it's realizing that we, generation by generation, have to reckon with our sins, the sins of the past and the sins of the present, and pray and hope that the next generation will know the Bible and apply it better than we did. Mm -hmm. Well, with having said all, having pointed our guns largely at ourselves now, <laughs> and there's, more, and there's yeah. a whole lot more we could say. Oh, for sure. We're not shying away from it, but we do want to kind of point out the window and say, um, there's this thing called Darwinian evolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Years ago, well, not as many years ago as dinosaurs. This was because I think I was married at the time. I wandered into a bookstore. In fact, we could probably figure out the date from this because someone had published, it was Barnes & Noble, I think, had pud published an um, anniversary copy of Origin of Species. And I picked it up and noticed that the title said Origin of Species. The title page said origin of species and then there was a lots of intro and preface and prologue you know all that stuff that you tell <laughs> your students no you don't have to read this <laughs> and then finally i got about 30 pages in. i got to the facsimile of the original title page mm. where for the first time 30 pages in it admitted the original title the origin of the species by means of natural se selection and the preservation of favored races there's a reason that wasn't on the cover mm -hmm. or the new title page. Preservation of favored races. Now, some people will jump forward and say, no, no, all that means is that some animal races are favored above others. Wait. And what is man in this worldview? <laughs> yes. Is man not an animal? <laughs> yeah, is, is that, that the whole point of the book, that man is the most advanced type of animal? And is not the implication of this that then that some branches of what we may broadly speak of as humanity are more evolved than others. Now, just in case we're, we're wrong there, 
Darwin told us in pretty flat language in another of his books what he's talking about. This is from The Descent of Man, which he published in 1871. And, and, and you have to picture Darwin saying these things with a sense of regret and almost tears in his eyes as he looks at the less favored races that remained in the world. He writes, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of men will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. At the same time, the anthropomorphous apes will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will intervene between man in a more civilized state, as we may hope, even than the Caucasian, and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of as now between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. Oh my gosh. Oh man. Now, in case anyone out there didn't understand what he just said, he's, he's bemoaning the fact that within centuries, not, not millennia, centuries, not very distant in terms of centuries, the civilized races, and, and he marks the Caucasian as the, the most civilized and most advanced, he says they're going to exterminate the savage races. You know, it doesn't say whether this will be accidental along the road of progress or whether it will be a big hunting party nor does it matter at all. But when this happens, he says, the, the more savage races will be exterminated and the more advanced apes, like the gorilla, will be exterminated. So that in that day, the gap between the more evolved race, something even more splendid than the Caucasian race, and something as low as the baboon, these will, be, these will form the edges of a huge gap, which currently is filled by the Negro, the Australian Aborigine, the gorilla, and so on. He lumps these categories, the black, the Aborigine, the gorilla, together. Some are the lower end of uh, their savage races, presumably human after a fashion, but destined for extermination. And the highest of, of the growth, he says, that gap isn't nearly as far as between some future white race and the baboon. And and I was I, I was impressed with both of your reactions. I mean, what other reaction can you have? But, <laughs> oh my, what is this? It's well, just clearly, clearly the only reason he felt that way was because of ingrained British imperialism. <laughs> That sarcasm, that sarcasm, right? <laughs> Thank you. Sarcasm. Just making sure. <laughs> no, it's it's yeah. We can now take a step, and, and we can pursue this. And and again, this is something where there's there's a lot of room to to look backward and forward and looking forward to its application to society and social Darwinism uh, in the hands of Spencer and the development of sociology and all that. We can look at. Um, the origins of Planned Parenthood and what's her name? Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger, mm -hmm. who swallowed this hook, line, and sinker and decided that the blacks and Jews and Hispanics need to be eliminated for the sake of America so that only whites should remain, the nation would grow strong, and so set about extinguishing these races at the fountain by setting up abortion clinics. And, you know, we like to, to blame the Nazi party for for instigating racism. But the truth is they looked over at what we were doing and said, wow, that's cool. Let's imitate that. But this is also a good time, I think, to look back, back to the ancient world and, and to the fringes of what we think of as the civilized world. When missionaries go into the far distant corners where the gospel has not reached, they universally have found that these, these unreached peoples have a word for themselves, which translates roughly into English as man the tribes beyond them they call by different names hmm. they are men they are people they are we would say human those other creatures things mobile sentient beings out there are something else barbarians barbarians we can look at ancient greece where we have exactly hmm. the same sort of thing Every city-state was a world unto itself, and the thing that made you human, as Aristotle reminds us, is your belonging to that particular polis. If you have no polis, you are an animal in the most basic sense. Humanity, a man, is by definition, he says, 
a political creature, a political animal, an animal who lives in a polis. And if you're not a polis, then you are in the most literal sense an alien. You are outside of this defining circle of humanity. And the only way that the Greek city-states could ever work together, since there each polis was dedicated to the worship of a particular dead ancestor, was to find an ancestor further back that everybody shared and then worship him. Because <laughs> these city-states were rooted in religion. They were religious to the core. Everything about them was religious, despite what the uh, secular textbooks tell us. And so the only way to grant true humanity to the other Greek city-states was to find someone you could worship who went back and preceded all of you. And they didn't do a great job at it, by the way. They spent a lot of their time fighting with one another. I'm just still kind of stunned by that Darwin passage. <laughs> it's just, bleh, yuck. Yeah. So identity in the Bible is not wrapped up in this word that is not really in the Bible of race. It, identity in scripture is rooted in family, tongue, and covenant, especially. There's a passage in Revelation that talks about all nations, tribes, and tongues. Mm -hmm. And I think you pointed out in one of your writings that race is not a category there. Race no, doesn't race. matter. <laughs> You know, and, and it, this is a time worth pointing out that, that the word race has undergone transformation since Darwin. Originally, it meant about the same thing that we mean by ethnic group. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a vague, gen generic term that, that you could fill in pretty much how you wanted. Since Darwin, the English race, the French yeah, race. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Still, perhaps not the best word to use, but it, it didn't have the connotations, let alone the, the definitions right. that we have since yeah. given it. But when you go back into the Bible, and, and, and you mentioned the book of Revelation, we see in um, chapter 7, the uh, heavenly crowds that surround the throne of the Lamb, they are all nations, kindreds, peoples, and tongues. Well, nations are covenantal groups. Kindreds, peoples, that's extended family. That's covenant, an extended covenant. Tongues is a little more difficult, but when we look at the book of um, Genesis and we see where language came from, and the, the passage I read earlier, we're told that these languages divided people according to their, their families and nations. That is, it's, it was not some odd genetic quirk. God did not cause a husband to speak Phoenician and a wife to speak Ethiopian. He divided them in terms of language groups. And so the language groups carried with the covenant, covenantal peopleness, the, the kindredness, the tribes. And it is, and we, we talked about this the last time, it, it is very significant. We, when we see the book of Revelation, both there and then later on, the tongues does not disappear as a category, nor do these kindreds, nations, and peoples disappear. It's not that when we get to heaven, we will all have the same color of skin, the same <laughs> eye color, the same kind of hair, the same, nor will we all speak the same language exclusively. Apparently, uh, people are able to sing together, and yet all tongues are represented. How does God do that? I have no idea, nor I'm sure it'll be really cool. And he Everyone's going to gonna know God. Latin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not Latin. Old solar. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right. Oh, yes. Or it's a Proto Hebrew or whatever, whatever it was. Or God will enable us to understand one another, though we continue to speak in different languages. Whatever it is, it will be a very beautiful thing and not something to be afraid of. But uh, we, we talked earlier about, about Adam. Adam is the covenant head of a race. That would be the human race, the human family. And Jesus came into that humanity true god of true god taking to himself true humanity and by the miracle of the virgin incarnation and, and virgin birth became a second adam a last adam the head of a new race now these races these families these covenant groups overlap in that we are all born from adam and we all are born sharing his curse and all guilty in adam and yet when christ comes to us and saves us begets us again by the gospel and by the power of spirit, we become members of a new race, a new family, a new people, a new kingdom. Uh, but this has nothing to do with genetics. It's mm -hmm. not that only white people or only black people or whatever designations you want to use get a place in the kingdom of God. It's not just the Gentiles or not just the Jews. 
It's open to all the sons of Adam, generically. If you're human, the invitation is there. Come and drink. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And, and this set Christianity apart from all the religions of the ancient world, not only in, in that you could conceivably become a Christian if you were born in some remote country or spoke some remote tongue, they actually came looking for you saying, <laughs> come along and join us. You're one of those language, people, groups, nations, covenant entities that, that Jesus died for. Come and be part of this miracle of recreation of this new heavens and new earth. And, and it is a sad thing when somewhere along the line, the, the outgoing missionary zeal of the church dwindled and we became content with first the Middle Ages, Christendom of the Middle Ages, that, that lost a good deal of its missionary enthusiasm. And then even when it came, when missionary enthusiasm came back in the wake of the Reformation and um, the Puritan movement, very quickly it too got uh, secularized and, and channeled into, Brian mentioned, mentioned uh, British imperialism, but the British were by no means unique in that. And, and then along comes dispensationalism and says, but wait, all we really need to do is save a few people from every, every group. As long as, some, as long as every group is represented, even by a token number, that's enough to fulfill the gospel being preached to all nations. And then the end can come and Jesus can come back. So we're not really interested so much in the, the salvation of these nations, the discipling of these nations as nations. We just want to evangelize and preach and witness so that the rapture can happen. So that we can be done and get out of here and so there are a lot of factors and that's that's just skimming the surface but there are a lot of factors that led in to this well we're in we got saved we're good who cares about the rest of the world surely god doesn't <laughs> care that much i mean we'll 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 die over god loves the world we won't die to go tell the world that though mm -hmm. and that's been a very sad thing uh, where the church has failed Many, many times, many, many centuries. Of course, today, if we do that, we're called all kinds of nasty names for trying to impose our religion upon these innocent, naive peoples <laughs> who are quite content with their own religion and don't need to hear from us. And it is important to distinguish between bringing the gospel to people and bringing the trappings of the way we do church in evangelical Indeed. America. Mm. I remember hearing stories of, I think there were some tribes in, I can't even remember what country in Africa, but they had been evangelized by some American missionaries and they asked for music instruction. Like mm -hmm. we need to do worship like you do worship. And thankfully the missionary said, no, you, you have music. Let's, let's write some songs in your language and you can dance the way you dance and do music the way you do music. There's, there's a beautiful, mm. beautiful diversity in musical styles and things like that, that, you know, we don't need to sing four parts to an organ to be worshiping God faithfully. <laughs> as much as I love organ music. It's, as much as we love yeah. organ music. But yeah, we have to be sensitive going down this way because there's so many ways to offend absolutely everybody with this discussion, but yep. some people need to be offended anyway. I mean, you already offended like the, the hardcore old Presbyterians by mentioning writing songs. So Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, we're, yeah Only we're right Psalms. Only mm. Psalms. We've already lost them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. We don't mean to be divisive, but... <sighs> But of course, you're right. And, and one of the things that we, we started by talking about the, the wonderful diversity of the image of God in man, every nation is different from every other nation. And that's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Not every, even if we looked at America at its hypothetical best, one nation under God, the <laughs> liberty, justice for I'm all. I'm not sure we've it's, had a best. <laughs> yeah, but thing. imagine that such a, that there were such a thing. Yeah. There, there's nothing in scripture that says, yes, and every nation in the world must look like that with that kind of constitution, that mm -hmm. kind of national laws, that kind of, that kind of markets. You go through the things. Yes, there are absolutes. And yes, mm -hmm. God's law speaks to, to every nation, but we're all going to work out differently. Every culture is going to be expression of our history, of our what we understand of the faith now, mm -hmm. uh, which will change, Lord willing, as we grow, as generations pass. 
of the technology available to us, of we look out the window, do we see mountains or do we see deserts? That's going to make a difference as to what kind of people we are. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Very languages. There are things that you can say in French that you really can't say very well in English <laughs> and even probably less well in German, you know? <laughs> uh, German has its own beauty. You want to make a new word, take old words and just tag them on and name <laughs> new words. Um, the... Uh, French would never do that, yeah. but the rest of us look at French and say, "Why? What are all those those letters at the end for? We don't understand." You know, I've heard a theory about this, and that's that newspaper writers and printers were paid by the letter. <laughs> <laughs> I I haven't looked into it, but I would yeah, believe it. I'll, I'll leave you to, to to look that one up. Oh, maybe maybe uh, German writers were paid by how few spaces they could use. Yeah. Yeah, that's how they counted the words, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. All right, getting us back on track <laughs> yeah, here. Back on track. What were we talking about? We're talking about covenant. Covenant oh, yeah. is rooted in the fellowship that is the life of the Trinity. It is expressed in God's relationship with us and in our relationship with one another. It assumes a sovereign God who can tell us what to do because he made us and owns us. But that God is love, and he invites us to love. And he lays down the rules and the boundaries for love. And he enables and enforces from one generation to another with the goal of growing a people, building a kingdom and a holy city. And we're going to be talking before too long. And we're going to come back to our ongoing thing of Zion, of the New Jerusalem. And what we see and what we've been talking about when we look at the end of the story is that God takes all sorts of peoples from all sorts of environments and historical traditions, geographical locations, skin colors, eye shapes, and he pulls them into something of incredible beauty. It's not, you know, the, the Puritans were wanted to be faithful to God in their worship, and so they tended to worship in white, washed, rectangular buildings so that nothing would be a distraction from the worship of the soul. And while I can appreciate what they thought they were doing, they missed a good deal in the process. <laughs> First of all, they tended to identify worship with intellectual processing, which is not a biblical concept. But they also divorced themselves from a good deal of Christian tradition, some of which, yes, was dangerous and wrong, some of which was beautiful and glorious. The, the New Jerusalem is not a whitewashed cube. It's a cube, mm. <laughs> but it's a cube of immense size filled with gardens and jewels and gems and people and trees and rivers. It's a wonderful blending of city and garden all together. It's full of life. It's an incredible, wonderful thing. All nations, peoples, kindreds, and tongues. And, and any kind of deviation from that vision should should catch our attention. We should wonder, wait, what you're saying doesn't seem like, it seems like there's some people you want to exclude from that end story. That bothers us. Something's not right here. We need to inquire further. Yeah. I was Googling around and, you know, I wouldn't want to Google proof that the Bible is racist because that would be leading right. Um, so oh, I just Googled, is the Bible racist? <laughs> um <laughs> And I got several pages of Christians showing that, no, in fact, the Bible is not racist. Um, but mixed in among that, there were a couple of articles that claimed that the Bible was racist, mostly Huffington Post, which is not really surprising. Huffington Post is like a blog aggregate. Of all the things that surprised me, this did not make the list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was funny because I found... I found like two articles that really came up with significant results, you know, first couple of pages. And both of them were like, you know, Bob Jones Sr., founder of Bob Jones University, said thus and such. Therefore, ergo, and without <laughs> any possibility of the contrary, the Bible is so racist. <laughs> it's just it like so just... racist because of the reason. Yeah, isn't it conceivable that Bob Jones Sr. was mistaken? <sighs> yeah. Yeah, I've... Um, let us leave it at Bob Jones Sr. was grievously, seriously mistaken 
to the point of sin and leave him to God. <laughs> he he said and did many good, wonderful things. This wasn't one of them. <laughs> and the institution that he helped found was tarred by this for a very, very long time. I would like to believe that they are past it. <laughs> My martial arts instructor was a Navajo Indian. He went to that particular school, <laughs> met his wife there. She was not a Navajo Indian. She was as white as they come. And they were told that they basically had to stay apart from each other mm. for exactly these sorts of reasons. Mm. It's we're, we're not making this up. This was a thing, and it's a thing that we hope is long gone, and that apologies and repentances have been made both to the wide world and most of all to God. Mm -hmm. And yet we also have to be very, very careful. It is so easy for us to look at ourselves and make ourselves the standard for how the world ought to be. People like me are cool. People who are not like me are iffy. And <laughs> you can't extend that to the point where they become aliens or they become... You know, we, we start with classless clueless. We end up with with barbarian. We end up with beneath our notice and contempt and hardly worth crossing the street with the gospel to reach them. We, we do have to be very, very careful and acknowledge that although the image of God manifests itself in, say, us, who are lovers of books, lovers of music, lovers of good food, a bit nerdy, a bit intellectual, a little bit creative, who stand in a Reformed Presbyterian tradition and yet have high respect for the or maybe there's no yet there, for the, <laughs> the, the creeds and confessions of the early church, the church Catholic, and who love Lewis and Tolkien and things like that. And yet we, we, we don't say that people who aren't any of that aren't worth our time, that they're not our brothers and sisters in Christ because they don't like Tolkien or they, they don't like organ music or they're not intellectuals or... They'd rather spend a day playing soccer than, than reading a good book. The, the kingdom of God and the image of God in man is infinitely diverse. Mm -hmm. And we have to get beyond ourselves and say, you know what? I could never do what you're doing. It doesn't even really interest me a great deal. But you know what? There's skill and there's wisdom and there's beauty here. And that's a gift from God. I can, I can take a few minutes and watch you do that and try to learn and try to appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can shut up for a minute and let you talk to me about this wonderful thing you do. Because the moment we start thinking, we are the people and wisdom dies with us, <laughs> well, we got a problem. And yeah. one, another thing that this kind of brought to mind is how when you read the scriptures in such a way that this, there's this genetic difference that determines a person's ultimate allegiance and you know if if, if someone who it, in their ancestry has a demon because you know the, the demons laid with the the sons of god in genesis or something mm -hmm. then you don't want to you you can't think of them as your your equal and you certainly would never think to bring the gospel to them like you said but more than that they're the enemy yeah and mm -hmm. that's 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 wrong obviously we we all agree that's wrong yeah. but um <laughs> I, I i immediately thought of ephesians 6 where we're told we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rules of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places though those may express themselves in particular earthly ways to us through mediums through wicked rulers who denounce the lord and put restrictions on the worship of his church but that doesn't mean those people are irredeemable yeah. from our perspective mm -hmm. yeah look it at doesn't Nebuchadnezzar. Make them less than human <laughs> exactly nebuchadnezzar as well the mm -hmm. this is a human tendency the human tendency is always to find a scapegoat and find mm -hmm. something to blame that you can put your your hatred on and yes. mm -hmm. That's not the way we're supposed to deal with sinners who need yes. Christ. 
mm-hmm. even even the people who reject it over and over and over again, they can they can still come to Christ. And their repeated rejection of, of the Lord doesn't make them less worthy of his grace because Christ chooses weak vessels to showcase his power and his glory. If it was a question of worthiness, none of us would make it yeah, in. Exactly. exactly. And, yeah. and God, as you say, often glorifies himself most in choosing the weak, imperfect, non-glorious things of this world. And so, yeah, someone who has rejected the gospel again and again doesn't mean we give up. May mean we mm-hmm. get kinder and more subtle in our approach, but they're, if, yeah. if they're human and they're breathing, they're still within the call of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And we are and, to offer the gospel. And we are the... to offer the gospel in humility and love <laughs> yeah. and not, yeah. not give up and not treat yeah. them as non-human because mm-hmm. they're not like us. I think there's an application of this idea. I mean, it seems so trivial in comparison to, you know, how you treat your neighbor and how you treat people of different backgrounds. But in art criticism, how it's so much easier to say, oh, I just hate country music. It's because Mm -hmm. it's fun to hate country music. It's much harder to take something that's not what you usually listen to and listen for things that are good about it. I've been meaning for ages, well, kicking around this idea in my head. I'll let you know if it ever actually happens. But I want to start a podcast called Country Music That Doesn't Suck and Why It Is Tolerable. <laughs> because I hated country music as a child. There's a little prejudice there. But like, I want to learn to listen for things that are good. And it's yeah. really easy to find things that are bad. And I think a lot of us don't enjoy country music. Well, but there I don't are do very that much, are but my girls have discovered yeah. it and they play it quietly in the background and I am learning mm-hmm. to appreciate a good deal of it. Yeah. But their their tastes are such that they like good music of all sorts and they come mm-hmm. up with the strangest things, but it's all good. Mm-hmm. Their tastes are better than mine. And I, I'm trying to have the humility to say, yeah, that's not my music, but maybe it can be. I'll listen mm-hmm. yeah. and I'll appreciate Again, recognizing the, the wonderful diversity of mankind that often does does get tied to ethnicity. The the songs that came out of uh, black slavery, uh, later out of New Orleans and, and Chicago. No, there's the beach sound. <laughs> yeah, there's New yeah. York. There's the beach sound. There's 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 the wheat fields of Kansas. There's the the wide open range of the American Southwest. Lots of different kinds of music. Mm-hmm. and different kind of art forms. And we don't have to say, I have to enjoy that the way you enjoy that. But we can say, just because it doesn't ring my bell doesn't mean it's not good. Right. And I can appreciate you appreciating it mm-hmm. and not yell, hey, turn off that noise. Unless, of course, it just <laughs> actually is noise. But that's another thing yeah. way beyond my uh, competence to decide. So speaking of music and things that we like, let's recommend some things. Okay. How is that for a segue? That was a that wonderful good, segue. Huh? I was wondering how yes. you were going to pull that off. <laughs> of course, we've made it less smooth by talking about how smooth it was. Yeah, that's <laughs> the, the tragedy. Of segues. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of segues, do you want to give us a recommendation, Brian? Uh, unless Greg wants to go first. No, Brian, you go ahead. Fair enough. In, in it's actually very relevant. I was thinking of this before the episode started. I actually have a musical thing to recommend. Yeah, it was uh, recommended to me over this past weekend from a band, also fittingly, that I did not have a lot of respect for. <laughs> um, but I am going to heartily recommend the Linkin Park album Thousand Sons. Hmm. It's a phenomenal story album. The melodies are fantastic. There, there are two tracks that have explicit language. Just they're marked E for explicit, like they're curse words. Um, so, so if that content anyway, warning, if you're it, sensitive if that's of ear, that you are sensitive to. You may skip those tracks, but it is a very, it's a very good album. It talks about war. The album title is a reference to uh, something Oppenheimer uh, thought mm. of when he saw the first successful uh, nuclear detonation. Something from the Bhagavad Gita which is, Mm. if the Mm -hmm. sky were to fill with the radiance of a thousand suns, would it not be like the appearing of one of the divines? Mm -hmm. Mm. And later, at a different point, they actually sampled this audio clip from him in one of the tracks. There's several 
quotes uh, throughout the album, and it's very well put together. But his quote where he says, you know, a few people laughed, a few people cried, most were just silent. And I remembered that line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, where Vishnu is trying to convince the king to do his duty, and he takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Mm -hmm. I suppose we all felt that in some way or another. And the whole album kind of just carries this whole thing through with war uh, and, and themes. And it's very good. Thousand Sons, Lincoln Park. I Thank you. My uh, tastes and perceptions of the band were challenged. So <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah, but Greg? how about you? Oh, I have so many things. I have so many things I want to recommend. I want to recommend my father's ginger molasses cookies that I've been enjoying. (laughs) I want to recommend gardenias because they smell wonderful, especially if you're trapped in your house and don't want to light incense like I would normally do because my husband doesn't like the smokiness in the air. I was afraid to light incense for a while because I was afraid people would think I was going like Eastern mysticism or like... Greek Orthodox or something. And then I thought, well, I like candles and no one thinks I'm Catholic. So (laughs) anyway, but what I wanted to recommend was, oh gosh, now I've forgotten. (laughs) Doggone it. What feelings did it bring to you? Imagine you were sitting in your chair thinking about (laughs) gardenias. What do you see? What do you feel? I want to to show you some images. (laughs) But I would like to recommend Living Life Backwards by David Gibson. Uh, it's a short little commentary on Ecclesiastes that I found very edifying and sound and just very well-rounded and wise. And I will recommend a book because it spins, what, what we've been talking about spins around its major theme, Ken Ham's One Blood, a Biblical Answer to Racism by... Green Forest Publishers in Arkansas, Masters Books. Actually, it's the public. The city is Green Forest, Arkansas. The publisher is Masters Books, nineteen ninety nine. Kinham, of course, is a central figure in the new generation of creation scientists, and he is a presuppositionalist, and he does a marvelous job of pointing out all the kind of stuff we've been talking about. So, if someone wants uh, further sources and more discussion, this is a book to go to. Marvelous. Neat. I didn't realize he was a presuppositionalist. He is. Um, I'm not sure how much he uses that word, but you listen to him. It doesn't take very long for him to get to the point of saying the proofs are never going to convince anybody. We're dealing with yeah. religious assumptions. Mm-hmm. And and that's what the creation science movement has needed. It's needed someone to say, arguing details is not arguing. It's standing basically on their ground. You want to shoot down their beliefs. That's That's fine and good as far as it goes. But of course, they'll simply say you're wrong until they have a choice and then they'll jump the ship and they'll say, Oh yeah, we were wrong, but look, we have a new idea that's even better. Yeah, you have to have that that something to fill the place of the things you're shooting down. You know, the thing. amazing thing about Darwinism is it has never been science. It has always been mm-hmm. speculation. And as soon as they are forced to admit that their current position is not scientific, they will abandon it and jump to something else that also does not have sufficient scientific background, but then the argument has to start over. The one thing they will never abandon is the basic assumption that somehow man evolved from lower races. Mm. And that, of course, presents this inevitable issue of, well, then what about racism? And they don't like that, and they want to get away from that by and large. Mm -hmm. But given the whole mechanism, it's something they haven't really been able to find a way out of yet. Yeah. Anyway, Ken Ham... And it's, yeah, it's interesting. That reminds well. me. Oh, oh <laughs> well, it's interesting as well because um, I had taken several science classes. Uh, not that that makes me a scientist or an expert on science in any case, but one of the criticisms that was put forward in in either the textbook or maybe it was the teacher speaking and lecture. I don't remember for sure. Was he was criticizing uh, the God of the gaps, and and that is its own error where Christian people say like, well we don't know how gravity works. So that's something that God does. And, you know, then it gets explained <laughs> more thoroughly. Now, gravity is not like anywhere near being perfectly explained by physicists. Um, no, they have no idea what it is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they know so, how it works, which is where Newton started. Sorry, I do have a degree in physics. It's okay. No <laughs> uh, you're right. Um, 
but you know, it, once the the thing gets explained, they're like, "Oh, okay. Well, now we know how that works. It can't be God," which is wrong. Yeah. At the start, but what's ironic is that this this teacher or the textbook, whichever it was, made that comment and that criticism of faith of the Christian faith, but Darwinism follows the exact same thing. They just replaced what yeah. God is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it reminds me of the line in Terry Pratchett's books. It's part of the Tiffany aching cycle. I forget which of the four books it is, but he says, just because it, you know how it works doesn't mean it's not magic, which is yes. a great <laughs> line, like <laughs> on point. But it's also just, like you said, replacing God with something else. For the secularist, it's magic you have to believe in something beyond what you can explain because you're human and you can't explain everything yeah Yeah. okay well it's good to talk to you all again yeah you as well thanks for being here pleasure to be thanks to david our producer and my lawfully wedded husband thank you to our supporters if you would like to join their number you can visit our website uh, to give a monthly gift anchor.fm slash halting towards zion or if you'd like to give a one-time gift uh, you can visit our paypal which will be in the show notes because i can't remember it right now you can send us an email at halting towards zion at gmail.com you can like our facebook page halting towards zion you can follow me on goodreads and recommend me some books Thanks for tuning in. Hope you've enjoyed this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. Have a good night.